Right. Um, hey, yeah, as Adrian said, I'm Keegan. Um, I work at a company called Sourcegraph. We basically, we've been using Kubernetes for a while and we've gone through a few different ways we've managed things, so I thought I'd talk about it. Um, yeah. Uh, so this talk is very much targeted at people that already are using Kubernetes and are familiar, have written like YAML files before, which define resources. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is like just go over a few different ways you can go about doing that. And I think if you, if I'm targeting that audience, the best way to kind of see that is to see examples to get a feel for it. Um, but yeah, and it's only a 15 minute talk, so if you haven't used Kubernetes, it's gonna end soon. Um, yeah, so why not just play in YAML? So when you browse through the Kubernetes documentation, all the examples are these just simple little YAML files that seem pretty manageable. But when you actually deploy it in your organization, you get everyone writing their own YAML files. You get a lot of them. Uh, and at some point you realize you kind of want some consistency between how you do things. Um, you want to, um, and then when you start wanting consistency, there's kind of, you introduce a bunch of boilerplate. An example that's very common is um, there's metadata that people always add, like an app metadata saying, hey, my app's called the front end. Or uh, there's a uh, metadata for your team, like I work on the back end team. Um, and that sort of metadata is useful. And, but then you also get other sort of things like uh, if you create a persistent volume, use this annotation to get this sort of feature on your cloud. Um, yeah, uh, and then you also get kind of organizational things where you have certain ways you put your resource limits in or you want to enforce resource limits. Um, there's other ways to go about it in like in the Kubernetes server, but that kind of stuff's I think quite experimental. Um, and then yeah, you also, it's a very blunt tool, YAML, and it's very verbose, so you quite often then want to create helpers to help you write these things. A common example is um, using service accounts and RBAC, like the, the, the authorization stuff. That's, you have to create like four YAML files every time you do that, and it sucks. So yeah, you want to improve that. So to get a bit of history of why I'm talking about this, um, we switched to using Kubernetes for our main site in late 2015. Um, our product, we actually ship into customers' data centers. A lot of people don't feel very happy sharing all their private code to a service online. Um, so for us to get access to the code, we had to work really hard to make it so that they put it in the data center. We decided in late 2016 that the way to do that is via Kubernetes. We were doing it another way before, but we was like, eh, take a bet on Kubernetes. Um, then when we were doing that, we were actually shipping a binary to people that generated the YAML files. And <laughs> the reason we did that is that every single organization was kind of doing Kubernetes differently. So we wanted like, to give them the ability to change the output to suit their organization. Um, uh, when I get into the examples, you'll get some ideas about that. Um, then late 2018, I mean early 2018 this year, we started using Helm instead of our custom stuff uh, because Helm seemed like what people were liking. Um, but then Helm is super complicated and not that great. Uh, so we actually switched recently to just doing the plain old YAML file way. At least that's what we give customers. We don't necessarily generate it that way. And we give a good guide on how to then take those YAML files and adjust it for your organization. And I'll, I'll explain some of that stuff. Um, but yeah. So uh, why do we have like crazy stuff at Sourcegraph? Because we have um, optional services, so we, we analyze languages. Um, so if you don't use C++ in your organization, you don't need to ship the C++ service. So that's an example of an optional service. Um, then also we have customers. Some customers have like 10,000 repos. They have very different scaling requirements to a customer with just a handful or a customer that has one massive repository. They'll need like massive nodes or something like that. Um, yeah, and then the, the, the requirements, an example of like a requirement is some people want a very specific security context. Uh, yeah, and you can see what we do. We have our resources in a public repo. There's a whole bunch of dirty history if you look in the past, it's all there. But yeah, so that's just a bit more of an example of like the kind of customizations we offer to customers. Um, it's all kind of boring, but it's necessary. 
Um, right, so I'm going to go over some options. So there's plain YAML, that's what you get in the Kubernetes documentation. Uh, there's Helm. Uh, there's Helm 2 at the moment. Helm 3 is in the making, which improves on a lot of things. Uh, there's doing code generators, which is something I prefer, and it's what we did originally, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Then there's case Sonnet, which we haven't used, so I'm just going to kind of like briefly talk about it. And the same with D-Hall, which is also a new project, which we haven't used much. We had an experiment using Customize. Um, I'll also talk about that, um, but it didn't really pan out. Right, so plain YAML. How do you manage plain YAML? You basically have a directory structure where you have a crap ton of YAML files. And you try and put a consistent naming. This is probably, your organization might do it differently, but this is just an example. I output some of our YAML files and cut off the, the output. Um, then if you just have plain YAML files, um, you'll do something like just use kubectl apply. Uh, it's got a nice little option where you say prune and you give it a label selector, and you give it a directory that you kind of recurse into, and then everything, it'll update everything that matches that label, and if there's something in your directory that matches that label but is not in your directory, it'll delete it. So it's like a very poor man's Helm, if you're familiar with Helm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I gave an example, a little bit of a very simple service that we have. Uh, we have labels, like which part of the deploy is part of, um, a name, we give some extra annotations. This is like the kind of stuff we like to enforce in, internally. Um, yeah. And then, so now if we switch to Helm, um, what Helm is, it's, uh, it's kind of two parts. There's the client side, which is, well, it's actually done on the server, but there's a templated language which takes YAML files and you've got a template over it. Um, it's using Go templates but it's kind of like all the worst things about like the C Mac Pro processor where it has no idea about the language. So you can create invalid YAML files and you'll only know at the worst possible time and then it will give you a very opaque error message. Um, so it's not the most friendly way to do things. Um, the server side component is Tiller. Um, all the other options I'm talking about don't have the server side part. So a, a good reason to use Helm is um, it kind of like versions your deployments and things like that, but it's, it's also very opaque. So when things go wrong, you don't know what's going on. Um, right, so if you remember the tree we had before with the just plain YAML, it kind of looks exactly the same in Helm, uh, except there's like this helpers.tpl, uh, which is a bunch of like template functions, and the actual files themselves look vastly worse. Um, <laughs> so, here, here's an example, a very common thing that we do is we like to manage our environment variables we set, trying to do the whole 12 factor thing. Um, and yeah, so you kind of, we invars as a dictionary, we updating environment variables, then somewhere in there we have a helper which like generates a nice environment map. Uh, so yeah, this is the, the, the magic thing for the template is the two um, curly braces. So this is just an example of all the curly braces in that simple service. Um, and if you look somewhere, there's something about environment, but then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And that other stuff gets duplicated in every single file. Like we have customers that want a volume mounted on every single uh, pod, even though we don't use it. I don't know. Um, so we have to add that to every single uh, YAML file that we ship. Some customers like to use Jaeger, which is a distributed tracing system. If they're using it, then we have to put some extra environment stuff in. Some customers like a specific security context. So, so it's like it's all there and every single file needs to repeat it. And every single YAML file looks terrible. And there's a lot of boilerplate. So Helm is very much aware of this. There's uh, proposals and I think they're working on it. Essentially replace the templating stuff with Lua script. Um, it doesn't exist, but the proposals do. So I've just copy pasted some of the example code from a, this, this blog post at the bottom. Um, yeah, so that looks a lot like the YAML before, uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, but you could change it. You could create a, a little library that you share, which has a function which generates that structure, and then you just call the function. Um, and it's like Helm, which I didn't mention actually before, that there's variables and things like that. You have exactly the same stuff with, with uh, Helm 3. So that's hopefully will be quite a nice product when it comes out. Uh, okay, that's a terrible screenshot. Um, then my favorite form is code generators. I mean, I'm a, I'm a developer, so I like to write code. 
the great thing about Kubernetes, well, we're a Go shop, so we, we've gravitated to this straight away. Um, Kubernetes is written in Go. All those resource YAML files that you're writing, they get marshaled into these Go structs that they actually, you can consume yourself. So you can write code generators which directly integrate, uh, directly import these structures, and you get all the documentation. The, the best part is, wait, let me just jump to the best part. The best part is, it's a programming language. So you get your IDE features. So you can like hover and get like a hover tooltip. You can jump to the definition. You can find all the places in your code base where you use it. Um, that's what I think is quite exciting about using code generators. Um, if that's not, that's not visible, so I'm not even going to bother. But, uh, and the nice thing about code as well is you can, just in your unusual code, you can kind of create abstractions like you normally do. Um, so you can try and create really succinct abstractions that kind of look like that Lua script earlier. Um, so you can do this in Go. You can do this, I think, in any language that has basically a Kubernetes library, um, client library. So it's not just restricted to Go, but we're a Go shop, so that's why it's my, that's my example. Um, Right, then there's this customize. So customize is kind of like a mix between the plain YAML and wanting to like change uh, environments, a uh, change like uh, customize, yeah, it's in the name. Um, so let me just show an example. So this is a customized patch file. It takes the metadata at the top, which is saying this is a deployment with the name Sourcegraph Frontend. When you run customize, it goes through your whole directory, looking for something that matches that metadata, and then like merges in the rest of the file. So this is an example customize, which adds TLS environment variables from a secret. Um, you, you have a file at the top saying, okay, get the base, use the patch, use TLS. Um, then there's, so that's, that's essentially case on it. It's, it's still quite an early project. It does that and just that really. Um, then there's case on it. It's a bit more mature. Um, it's based on a project called JSON it, which I believe is very much inspired by how Google does configuration internally. Um, it's essentially JSON plus plus. So JSON with functions. Um, and variables and things like that. And then case on it is doing that, but then giving you Kubernetes integration. Um, it looks pretty funky. Uh, as I said, I haven't, I haven't used this much. We just we kind of looked at it a little bit when, and as a, when we were looking what to do next. Um, if you can read that code, it looks very much like the, the namespacing that you get in Kubernetes objects, resources, and the interesting thing is it also does the whole like merging things in a weird way. So this is, looks like code, but the, the JSON it bit is then your parameters can import other parameter files. And if you look at the little pluses, it kind of like takes it and shoves it into the JSON that already exists. Um, so it's very declarative. Right, and then finally, dhaul. Dhaul is like a new thing written by uh, Haskell lovers. Um, essentially, the, the computer science way to explain it is it's a programming language that's not Turing complete, so you guarantee that it'll, um, you can't do anything crazy in it. Um, I.e. there's no like, uh, it, it's guaranteed to terminate. So it's a configuration language that just has enough power to do some interesting things, but not too much that you shoot yourself in the foot. And yeah, so it's, it's a whole general language for configuration. There's a specific project called dhaul Kubernetes um, the little text that I put in there is the blurb from their GitHub repo. Um, the, the issue is, is it's inspired by Haskell. So unless you're a Haskell programmer, this, this looks like junk. Um, yeah, but it, it, the ideas behind it are super powerful. This is a very simple example. There's a lot of composition and things like that you can do, which is, I think it has a lot of potential in the future. And that's it. Thank you, any questions? So YAML files, and uh, you can also use variables um, that pull in facts um, into your um, YAML, and thereby you could, for argument's sake, www env, 
and the domain copy it, <coughs> and that will just pre-populate everything. I don't know if you've checked it out or if it will even work for you, but uh, super simple for us, and uh, it just creates this nice hierarchy. But um, I guess I guess it kind of sounds. Is it more powerful than just like simple templates? Like, is there type correctness and things like that, or do you only find out when it tries to generate that things are broken? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's like one of the weaknesses of Helm, I guess you could say, that you would create a generator and it would put, it's all YAML, so like, it expects a string, but you write and you put the string true, but YAML's that's a, a boolean and then everything explodes. Yeah, from that, we in Puppet, we use these paper drops. So you just, uh, you have a string, you're very Okay, and you cast it kind string. of thing, yeah, all right. Okay, you can do the same in Helm. Um, so for your code generators um, in Go, do you generate a binary and use the binary um, externally, or what do you? We used to sh so we used to ship that binary to okay. people. Um, now what we kind of do is we still have the binary, and we actually adjusted it to read in YAML files and then do stuff to them. So like either customize them or enforce like lint rules, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, it ends up you end up creating a very succinct kind of like very tight generation for each like deployment. Because I mean, all deployments basically look the same, essentially, except you might add a volume or add some environment variables. Yeah, but yeah. Cool, thanks.